Reformed Church. So this particular sort of phase of the Yet Not I series is um, about circumcision. And the, the word circumcision is really just a symbolic word for, again, what we've been talking about for 20-some parts right now. Um, I'm not necessarily adding a ton of new information to the principles that we've already taught that Jesus has given us rest from works by giving us his spirit, right? As simple as that is, in this sort of little phase that we've been doing right now, uh, and I would encourage anybody listening right now, listen to the past messages. Um, it, it's just, even if you got to be playing it while you're doing something else to be able to get through it all, because there's a lot of information, definitely listen to that. Because all the stuff that we've been teaching in the past, that is circumcision. Rest from works by the Spirit is what circumcision is. We're just now, for the past several messages, been using the word circumcision, but it's really what we've been talking about this entire series, right? Uh, circumcision in, in particular is when the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of you, that initial death that we've been learning about, that initial rest that we received by the Holy Spirit, that event is called circumcision. As I said before, as a believer, this, you know, if, if, if you've been around church for any length of time, you've probably heard the I die daily. I die daily thing quoted, like because Paul said that. Um, that is not applicable to this crucified with Christ, rest from works concept that we've been talking about. When Paul said, I die daily, he was referring to his persecutions. And he was saying that he goes through death, which is basically just another way of him saying hurt and suffering um, daily. So that's not applicable to this circumcision or this rest from works that we've been given by the Spirit. Um, that happens one time for all time. You can walk in the Spirit now, because if we live by the Spirit, therefore let us walk by the Spirit. If we are dead, then we can also put to death the deeds of our, of our body, the deeds of our members. In other words, we can start walking in the Spirit and taking advantage of the fact that the Holy Spirit has come in to give us rest. Um, that is the simplest way to say it. We can take advantage of the rest that we've been given at salvation, but that initial death never has to be repeated. You, you have, uh, the Holy Spirit has taken authority over your flesh, over your body, and over your mind both. It's not just rest for your body. I know that you know, a lot of times when we talk about rest from works, we, we're strictly speaking about rest for our body, like for our actions, so that we don't have to do these various different things anymore because the Holy Spirit has been given to us to do them through us, but even our mind. It may be kind of foreign to us that we would talk about that you don't have to think for yourself anymore, but that's the truth. Uh, you can have rest in your mind as well, because the Holy Spirit has taken authority over your body, over your mind. And again, that's what we were talking about last service, was that um, this is what was meant when Paul talks about in Romans chapter 2. You can throw this up there while, while I'm talking about the column. Uh, Romans 2.28. Um, it's actually verse 29, technically, the one that I want, but uh, it talks about the circumcision of our heart. And it says that he is a Jew... Um, but, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. In the spirit means basically by the spirit, essentially. He's saying that the spirit is the one that circumcised you. Uh, that's like saying the spirit is the one that puts you to death, right? Circumcision, again, is death by the spirit. Um, so when he says that circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, he's saying the Holy Spirit's the one that circumcised you, and part of you that was circumcised is your heart. Now, he only mentions your heart here, which is like your inner man, your inner flesh, your thinking, that's not the only part of you that was circumcised. He's just strictly mentioning uh, that part of you that was circumcised in this verse. But we read, even Moses talked about the circumcision of our lips. That would mean you not having to speak for yourself. This mentions circumcision of the heart. Circumcision of, uh, in, in, in Colossians chapter 2, it talks about circumcising the body of sins, uh, the body of the sins of the flesh. And so our body's been circumcised, our mind's been circumcised, our lips have been circumcised, which obviously is in the category of our body. But... Um, Body and heart make up your flesh, right? Or otherwise known, instead of saying body and heart, uh, otherwise known as your flesh and your inner flesh, or the, your man and your inner man. The inner man, you know, when, when Paul talks about our inner man, sometimes Christians that are aware of even what we know about, like your spirit that lives inside of you, might equate that as speaking about our spirit, like my inner man. But the word man is used for the word flesh in the Bible. As I told you uh, last week, I think it's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the very beginning of that chapter, equates fleshly with being a man. He says, that, he says, you were fleshly and walk in the manner of men. Okay? Fleshly and walk in the manner of men. So he sort of defines the word man as referring to flesh. Um, a, a quick note on this too. 
if you read the King James Version, like I primarily read the King James Version, it loves putting the word man in there where it isn't even really there in the text. So just be aware of that. And it won't even be italicized. It'll just say, you know, it'll put the word man in there like as if when it's just referring to an individual, it'll say man. But uh, that word man isn't a good word to use all the time because it specifically means your flesh. And your man or your inner man, your flesh and your inner flesh, your body and your heart, has been circumcised by the Spirit. And again, even when it comes to that, you say, well, what, is it, what do you mean, Pastor Mike, then? Not having to think for myself, because that sounds weird, that I wouldn't have to think for myself. Um, all that that means is, and I'm, I'm not going to like, teach on this really in full, but let me, let me show you how you activate not thinking for yourself. The truth is, you activate that the same way you activate anything else. All right? I'm going to give you just a quick sort of... Uh, Quick little teaching on this very, very briefly as to how to not think for yourself. Philemon chapter 1, you can throw it up there actually. You can just get the verse, I don't have it written down. But Philemon 1, um, and it's talking about the communication of your faith and how that is made effectual. In Philemon 1, Paul is writing to Philemon, and he says that the communication of your faith, which I believe that there is talking about love. Love is the result of faith. So uh, the communication of your faith, meaning what faith produces, uh, which is love. So he says that your love may be made effectual through the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. Okay? So, here's what he's saying. How is it that love, if you want love to be made effectual through you, how do you, how do you make that effectual? By acknowledging every good thing that's on the inside of you. You know, if, if you ever say something that you know you shouldn't say, or you say something that's not loving, you know what you really have to understand after that? Lord, I have been created the most loving person that has ever walked the face of the earth, or any other planet for that matter. You have to feel that way. You understand that? If, if, if you say, say or do something that's not loving, you need to acknowledge that I, I have been created in Christ Jesus, the most loving person that has ever been. Because Jesus is that. And you've been created like him. As he is, so are we in this world. Why would you say that? You say, well, that's not right. You need to own up to your wrongs. And I'm not saying you don't apologize when you do something wrong to somebody else, but I'm saying as far as you are concerned, you need to be mindful of the fact of everything that is good inside of you in Christ Jesus. If you are not willing to do, like, for instance, what I just said there, you, you, you do something that's not loving, and then to immediately acknowledge and say, Lord, I've been created as loving as I can possibly be in Jesus. Me being loving is a gift from God through Jesus Christ. If you won't acknowledge that, you're never going to make love effectual in you. You need to acknowledge what you have in Christ for those things to be effectual. I'm not talking about taking these things into your own hand. You let the Lord teach you these things, right? And, and, and as he brings things up, he knows exactly what you need to hear. He knows exactly what you need to acknowledge. Um, so I'm not saying when you do something unloving or something like that, that you just go in your Bible and look up all the verses on love. I'm, no, let's be guided by our shepherd, right? But still, things in you are made effectual through the acknowledging of it. The communication of your faith, that, which I believe is speaking about love, becomes effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that's in you in Christ Jesus. So when it comes to your actions or when it comes to whatever fruit the Holy Spirit wants to bear, the Holy Spirit has to teach you about that thing that you have in Christ before it can be produced in you. This is why it's always very exciting to understand when the Lord is teaching us, for instance, even at this church, right? Um, it is no doubt that this church is teaching a message that is unpopular. Right? We wish it wasn't unpopular, but it is important to state that it is unpopular because it will make you wary of what you're hearing outside of here because the things that the Lord has taught us here are very, very different from what you're hearing in traditional, just your traditional Christian church. And we are a Christian church, which if it, as long as you mean by Christian um, that we are centered on Jesus and what he finished for us and for the world, then we're Christians. If you want to say that Christian means believe in all the garbage that the church believes today, then call us whatever you want. Uh, we are focused, laser focused on Jesus and what he did for the world. If that's what being a Christian is, then that's what we are. Um, we don't much care about labels anyway. But the things the Lord's taught us here, resurrection of the dead, immortality, that, that just like Jesus does not die anymore, that's applicable to you as well. Um, that in other words, that that's yours in Christ to receive that. All these different things. What's exciting about the Lord teaching you something is that he's not, 
It, Moses put it this way. He said, it's not an idle word that the Lord is speaking to you. Idle meaning like it does nothing. If you learn math, that is an idle word. It doesn't produce something in you. It just, now you know it. Now, sir, you can take corresponding actions now that you know math. You know that you can add and subtract or whatever, and it helps you there. That's fine. Nothing wrong with math, but it is an idle word. It's not producing anything in you. Whereas the word of God is that seed that when it's put in our hearts, it actually produces something by the Spirit. So God has to teach you about something before it is made effectual in you. Uh, you, 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 you. In other words, if you learn about the resurrection of the dead, that's not like knowledge of the resurrection of the dead sitting in your head. That is producing in you power to raise the dead. Let me say this. You can't have actually learned. You cannot have actually learned legitimately from the Lord about the resurrection of the dead and not have the resurrection or raising from the dead power currently working in your body right now. You can't because the seed always produces fruit. God has to teach you about the thing before he produces it, though. You have to be okay with that process. If you are not okay with that process, then you're going to have to go and find yourself another Savior and do it a different way. That's how God's process works because that's how it has to work, okay? That is the only way for us to receive is for us to learn something about Jesus, and then it gets produced in our life. Again, if you don't like that process, then you'll have to find another Savior because that is God's only way, which obviously you understand I'm being facetious here, is the only way for mankind to receive. God needs to teach you about some aspect about what Jesus provided at the cross and how he's put it in you, in your spirit. Once he teaches you that, that would be the acknowledging of every good thing. You can throw that back up there. And, and actually, you don't, even have to clear, you don't even have to clear the verses. Don't even worry about that. Uh, but by the acknowledging of every good thing that's in you, uh, that learning about what Jesus has provided you, that's the acknowledging part. What happens from that acknowledgement? It makes it effectual. And again, if we're taking God's principles for what he's actually saying here, that's where I'm getting, or at least one of the verses, there's a slew of them, but that you cannot have learned legitimately from the Lord um, that Jesus has opened the graves, meaning there's no one that is in a grave right now that is locked there. No one. And learning about how you have immortality on the inside of you. And yes, that means not that Christians' human bodies automatically live forever. What that does mean is that immortality is there, which gives every single believer that lives now or has ever lived the potential for their physical, mortal, currently mortal, body to live forever. If you don't like that, then you do not believe you're like Jesus. He dies no more, the Bible says. You say, yeah, but even Jesus died. Correct, he did die. You know whose death that was? Marinate on that one for a second. Whose death was that? Marinate, 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 ding. Our death. It, your logic it's like we think it makes more sense that Christians would have to die despite the fact that we have a Savior who came and actually died our death in his physical body on the tree. So whose logic isn't adding up to the cross? Jesus died in a physical body. He, he prayed to the Father, Father, a body you have given me, because see, these people have physical problems, right? He, he saw all of us. He saw, he saw you, every single person in here. And said, Father, these people have physical problems that I know you want to fix. So we are partners in this, you and me, Father. And you have given me a body to accomplish your will for them. You know why? Because Jesus was taking physical pains, physical problems, physical death in his own body on the tree. And uh, because of that, we've been given resurrection from the dead, immortality, living inside of us. Do you have to understand these things before the Holy Spirit gives life, as Romans 8 says, to your mortal body? Sure. But your body is only mortal to the extent that the Holy Spirit has not given life to your mortal body. But the Holy Spirit is in you to give life to your mortal body so that it doesn't have to be mortal anymore. My whole point is, you learn something like that if you're really learning it. Not everybody does. Even people across America that go to church today, there's a lot of people that go to church that don't seek God at all. I, I, I cannot apply those, these principles to you. If you are seeking the Lord for yourself, I'm not talking about coming to church. That's a great start. You need to come to church. But if you're seeking the Lord for yourself, you're growing the knowledge of Jesus, you can't 
to use a double negative here, you can't not have those things being made effectual in you. Again, that's how the Holy Spirit puts to death the deeds of our body. You learn something that you have in Christ, and therefore that thing is becoming effectual. And that's why I said before that it's exciting when the Lord is teaching you something because it's not an idle word. If he's teaching you it, that means he's trying to produce it in you. You understand? He doesn't just teach you so you know. He teaches you so you can experience it. Now, sure, you know it first, and therefore that comforts your heart. Right off the bat, it'll produce a joy in you. Even for the parable of the seed and the sower, uh, where the people didn't even continue in the word of God, it immediately produced a joy in them. So that's, that's the great part of it, right? You've got your, your, your fears completely released there. You've got your cares rested. You've got uh, uh, you know, anxieties calmed just immediately by the receiving of the word. When you really get something, fears, fear goes. It immediately starts going. Cares immediately start being calmed just by receiving the word. But you continue in that word, it's going to bear fruit in you. And that is how, also, that's how anything works in our life. If you want a particular act, the Holy Spirit to uh, uh, live out a particular thing through you, God's going to start teaching. Again, we're not our own shepherd. I'm not saying start looking up verse in the Bible because you want that thing producing you. You're not your own shepherd. God has to speak it to you. Faith does not come by you strictly reading the Bible. Faith comes by hearing in your heart the word of God. When your heart gets it, when God speaks something to your heart, when the Spirit of God speaks something to your heart and you get it, that is where faith is born there. Not from you reading the Bible. You know, lots of people, the Jewish people today read the Bible. They're not getting anything. Because the Word of God is not in them. Despite the fact that they read the Bible. Because they're not getting it. Okay? When God speaks something to your heart, that's what faith is. That, that, that's where faith and belief is born there. And that will make those, whatever he's teaching you, it will make it effectual in you. But don't go on what you think needs to produce, be produced most in your life right now, and you start looking at verses for that. You're, you're off track, right? The Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. Not you're your own shepherd. And you say, well, how do I know what the Lord is teaching me? Uh, there's not, there is no formula for that. You just keep putting your attentions on the Lord. Read your Bible, come to church, do all those helper things as well. You keep your attentions on the Lord, though, and he will be bringing things up to you. And trust me, when he brings something up to you enough, um, especially as you grow, you begin recognizing the voice of God. But God will teach you something because he wants to make that particular action. He wants to make that effectual in you. He wants to work that out in your life. And the same thing goes. This may be confusing to some people. Okay, I'm not going to go. I could teach a small series on this. I'm not, I'm not going to do that right now. That's how God lives through you is that he teaches you something, some aspect of his spirit that Jesus has provided you that's on the inside of you, and then that aspect of the spirit becomes effectual. If the love of the spirit becomes effectual in you, your love is being put to rest. If the words of the Holy Spirit are being made effectual in you, automatically you've been replaced, your words are being put to rest. You see, it's, a, it's like, um, I, I don't even know how to say this exactly, but uh, it's like if you have an empty cup, right? And you, there's clearly, in an empty cup, there's really something in it, right? There's air in there. And then when you pour water in it, it displaces the air, right? Okay, boom, there's no more oxygen there because you're putting, it displaces it. It's like the Holy Spirit's work, right? When the Holy Spirit works, he's, auto, like, they're the same thing. The work of the Holy Spirit is your rest. He, he just displaces you. That's how he gives you rest. The Holy Spirit giving you rest doesn't look like this, you sitting on the couch. Like, the Holy Spirit giving you rest actually looks like activity, but it's displaced activity. He's displaced yours. So that's why I say when you learn something that you have in Christ and that becomes effectual in you, Whatever is effectual of the Holy Spirit in your life, and the Holy Spirit is effectual in every single believer to some extent, whatever is effectual of the Holy Spirit in you is whatever deed has been put to death of your flesh. Um, so how, how do you get this work of the Holy Spirit in your rest? You acknowledge every good thing that's in you in Christ. What you acknowledge, what you've learned thus far, is also effectual in your life. If you are someone in here right now, you may have never seen the dead raised, and to be honest, uh, again, I don't think I've ever seen anything raised from the dead um, that I'm aware of, but I would teach this message the same as if I had or when I do. Uh, when you learn something like that, that is actually effectual in you while you're acknowledging. Not when you see it or when you notice it. It's always effectual once, once you acknowledge these things. And so this works for anything, including your thinking. Okay, again, I'm going to give you a short little thing on this, but then we're going to have to move on. But when the Holy Spirit, when you acknowledge the Lord as your truth, 
when you acknowledge the Lord as your shepherd, when you acknowledge the word of God on the inside of you, not the word of God outside of you in the Bible. That is the word of God too. I get that. But that's the word of God through somebody else, okay? Paul has the word of God inside of him. And I, I guess you can't say inside of him because he, his spirit isn't in his flesh right now. So, but Paul has the word of God in his spirit, right? Um, Samuel has the word of God in his spirit. Um, all these people, the writers, the apostles that wrote the Bible, they have the word of God in their spirit. That's how the Bible was written. You have the word of God inside of you in the same portion that they have it. Um, when you acknowledge that it's there, when you learn about the word of God that's on the inside of you, when you acknowledge the Lord as your truth, that's what makes his voice effectual in your mind. That's the first thing when I'm spending time with the Lord, and I don't know, what, you know if he didn't put something on my mind already, that's the first thing that I begin to acknowledge. If you want something to get the ball rolling, so to speak, that's what you do to get the ball rolling. You acknowledge the Lord strictly as your, as your shepherd, as the word of God on the inside of you, as your guide, the Holy Spirit to lead you into all truth, right? The teacher on the inside of you. That's, that's, that's the one to get the ball rolling. If you ever want to get your meditation rolling, you got nothing, nothing kind of going on upstairs, that's how you get it going. Acknowledge the Lord as, 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 as uh, that he, he being the word of God on the inside of you. There's a lot I could teach about that. Uh, but that is what is meant in the book of Proverbs when it says that you have first have to acknowledge the Lord. In all your ways, acknowledge the Lord. That word acknowledge means some kind of knowledge. You have to acknowledge the Lord for him to make your path straight or for him to direct you. You want direction of the Lord? Doesn't it make sense, right? If Philemon is true, and it is, that you make things effectual by the acknowledging, if you want the word of God effectual in your mind, it would make sense that the Lord would say, well, you have to acknowledge me as your truth first. If you acknowledge me as your truth first and as the word of God living on the inside of you, you acknowledge that, then I'll be able to direct your paths because you acknowledge that that direction was on the inside of you. Okay? Understand there's probably a lot of questions with that. Maybe. Maybe. After service, no problem. But that's also how the Lord is able to think through you. You acknowledge him. You acknowledge the word of God on the inside of you. His thoughts, his word begins getting thrown up into your head. And then when he's thinking a thought, guess what you're not doing? You're not thinking. So again, uh, Resting from our works and not thinking anymore, not acting anymore, is not a decision that you can make directly. You, you can't just say, well, I'm not going to work anymore. Like, in other words, you, and I don't advise this, if you were to say, well, I'm not going to go to work in the morning because I'm resting in Jesus, that, 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 that doesn't do anything. It's still you. It would be you calling in and saying you weren't going to be there. It would be you sitting on the couch. It's still you. Like, it, you're f still fully working, even though you didn't go to work. The only way to get rest from your work is not to try to do less or something. Do, you trying to do less is not you resting from your works, okay? Uh, you learning Jesus, and when the Holy Spirit is effectual in you, that's the only way to get rest from your works. To the extent the Holy Spirit is manifesting through you is to the extent that you are resting from those works that he is now doing. All well, that makes sense. Again, that displacement sort of uh, analogy there, okay? So, so th that, that is how that works. And if you, want the, if you want to rest in your mind, in other words, in the sense of uh, sort of stop thinking for yourself and the Holy Spirit to put his thoughts in your mind, Begin acknowledging the Lord, and specifically acknowledging the Lord as your truth and as the word of God on the inside of you. And again, uh, that's what I do to get the ball rolling, prime the pump, sort of. Okay, I want, I want to learn from you, Lord. Thank you for being my truth. Thank you for living on the inside of me, being my teacher. And anyway, that's how all that works. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. But th th that is sort of the simplicity of how you start experiencing the rest from works that you've been given when you were first saved. All of that is called circumcision. All of that is called circumcision. Uh, let, me, let me read you uh, uh, just a couple verses for review. Philippians 3.2. Philippians 3.2 in the LSV. The, it's a literal standard version, the LSV. Um, LSV is very, very similar to the YLT, the Young's Literal Translation. Very similar. Um, but the LSV, if you haven't checked it out, I think it's pretty cool so far. I don't have a whole lot of uh, um, experience with it. But it seems pretty, pretty literal, pretty good. But it's easier to read than the Young's Literal Translation. So Philippians 3, uh, verse 2. He says, look out for the dogs or for the fools. Look out for evil workers. Look out for the mutilation. The mutilation there, he's calling people that are circumcised outwardly but not, don't have the true circumcision, the mutilation. Because he's basically saying all they've done is mutilate their bodies, right? They're not the real circumcision. They've just circumcised the outside, but that's just mutilation. That's not circumcision by the Spirit. Real circumcision is this, verse 3. For we are the circumcision who are serving God by the Spirit. Right? We've been over this verse. I just want to get everybody on the same page. Circumcision is when the Holy Spirit... Uh, takes over you to be able to serve God for you. So you're not working. The Holy Spirit is. That's what circumcision is. That's the easiest verse, again, that I told you recently that I have for defining circumcision. Uh, Colossians 
we do this one last thing, and we're going to get into uh, a sort of a short timeline. Um, I have a timeline to give you tonight, and uh, it's not as long as like ones in the past, and it's a, it's a little bit more a little bit more sparse, um, just because I, I just don't understand all of it. But I'm going to give you the points that I understand, and you'll be able to see the, the succession of things in that in there. Uh, so Colossians 2:11 also says that in whom you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. In other words, not just mutilating your body. That's not true circumcision. But in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You see, this is true circumcision. We went over last time, right, that outward circumcision is nothing, has no benefit whatsoever. True circumcision is the rest from works that we were given once for all time at salvation, right? Circumcision is a once for all time event, never to be repeated. Circumcision is only a reference to the initial rest from works that you receive from the Holy Spirit. The fact that you can take advantage of the fact that you've been circumcised as you go along as a believer, and everything we just discussed, right? You renewing your mind to what you have in Christ, and that being manifested more through you, and you resting more. That's you taking advantage of your circumcision. That's not you being circumcised repeatedly, right? One circumcision for all time. Crucified with Christ, perfect tense, uh, never having to be repeated. Uh, so true circumcision is the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ, and then he defines circumcision this way in next verse, uh, buried with him in baptism. That's how it happened, right? Buried is referring to our death, and he's saying put to death through baptism. And I've been through this a whole bunch in the past, right? But this baptism is talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit because Ephesians, the book of Ephesians says there is only one baptism. So he's saying his circumcision is just dying or, or, or being put to rest through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all right? All that clear? All that cool? All right, so let's, let's, uh, let's move on then from here, and let's get into uh, some, some symbols that, you know what, what's nice is I've already gone over these symbols in past messages in this very series, so I will not repeat all those words, but I'm just going to bring this in so that we can see it, so that at least as I'm going through stuff, you have something to reference. Um, it, I, I did not get time to proof everything before I, uh, I was kind of doing the rushing before a service to do this, so hopefully uh, there's no, I don't know what you call it, it can't be called a typo because I didn't type it, but anyway, hopefully there's no mistakes. Uh, real quick, house, we know the word house means flesh. We've already been through that in the past, right? House, tent, tabernacle, just so you know, all these words, uh, I believe all these words, yep, every single one of these words are on our glossary, reforminus.com slash glossary. Best website probably in the whole world, just so you know. So you want to go check out what's at reforminus.com and probably best Bible symbolic glossary in the whole world. May be the only one in the whole world right now. Check that out. Um, so, uh, and I'm not, this is not an Elijah complex, like, Lord, I'm the only one serving. You know, Elijah did that, that he thought he was the only one serving the Lord or something like that. This church is not the only one that knows the Lord, but certain things, when it comes to certain things, <laughs> might be the only one saying it. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, anyway, don't want to get into that Elijah complex, but you also just want to be accurate and never heard a lot of this stuff before. Okay, so, and if you think you did, you're probably just mistaken. Anyway, so house means flesh, right? Uh, again, if you want to, I'll just give you the reference. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 4 explains that. T calls our body a house, a tent, a tabernacle, and we've got the rest of the verses online. Egypt. This is the one that I really want to just, I want to focus on these two, especially right now. Uh, these are going to be the most important words to understand. Egypt means Gentile in the Bible. That can be used in a variety of different contexts. So stay with me on this one definition especially, because the word Egypt here is probably going to be the most complicated one to explain, but it's the one that is amongst the most important here to explain. Egypt means Gentile. Uh, if you can throw up uh, uh, Jeremiah 46.1. Egypt means Gentile, but again, if for anyone that's come to this church for a length of time or been on our glossary, you know that Egypt means Gentile, but here's the thing, though. So, so, so when you see the word Egypt, just think Gentile, non-Jew. Here's the thing, though. Okay, stay with me on this one. Gentile, though, can be referring to two different things because there's two different Israels. Because Gentile means not of Israel, basically, not Jewish. But there's two Israels. So Gentile can therefore mean two different things. So properly, Egypt means Gentile, but it can be used in either of those applications. For instance, I could be called an Egyptian. My flesh could be called an Egyptian symbolically in the Bible. In fact, it is. <laughs> We're actually prophesied of, all Gentiles that have received the word of God now are prophesied of in the book of Genesis, right? So we actually are referred to as when Joseph, representing Jesus, was brought down to Egypt, that was uh, uh, Jesus being brought to the Gentiles after his resurrection, right? Joseph came up out of the pit after his Jewish brethren threw him into the pit. Joseph rose out of the pit, Jesus' resurrection, right? Out of the pit, because Jesus really went down to the pit, under the earth. He rose up out of the pit, and after Jesus' resurrection, he'd be brought down to Egypt, which is what Joseph 
where he was brought, symbolizing that Jesus, Joseph, was being brought to the Gentiles. In that case, that's referring to uh, Gentile, like not physically Jewish, right? Not of the nation of Israel. My flesh was not born of the nation of Israel. I wasn't born of Abraham in my flesh, which doesn't mean anything, right? It's neither here nor there, but still, it's, it's a fact, right? So I could be called Egypt in that sense, but I wouldn't be called, as an individual, wouldn't be called Egypt in the other sense, which, because heaven is also called Israel. So if you are a sort of true Gentile, that means you're not of heaven. You're not a citizen of heaven. You're a citizen of this earth, not of heaven. So there's also, so there's physical Israel, and then there's heavenly Israel, right? You can read Galatians chapter 4, I think, for that, right? It explains that perfectly. The heavenly Jerusalem. So if you're not of the heavenly Jerusalem, you're still called a Gentile. So in that sense, I'm not, a, I'm not an Egyptian, you could say. I'm not of Egypt because I am not a Gentile to heaven. I'm a part of that Israel. I'm a citizen of heaven. I am a, a, a true Jew, right? So I'm not... Now, anyone that is not of heaven would be called Egyptian, earthly, not heavenly. So everyone understand that? Egypt does mean Gentile, but Gentile can be used in both contexts. Either not physically a Jewish, a Jewish person, not, a, not born of Abraham physically, or someone who's not of heaven, someone who is earthly. So that's why I put Gentile slash earthly, because in the context we're going to be explaining it tonight, Egypt is being used as earthly, not of heavenly Israel. So Gentile meaning not of heaven, okay? Something that is earthly. Uh, e e Egypt or Egyptian can be used for, again, uh, uh, earthly flesh. And I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give this piece away to you, too. In the, in the context of what I'm about to read you right now, um, Egypt is referred to as, like our flesh is being referred to as Egyptian, as not heavenly, earthly, not heavenly. Okay, so, so just keep that in mind. Uh, Jeremiah 46, 1 just says that, you know, he, he says that the, the Lord uh, gave a prophecy to Jeremiah. It says the prophet against the Gentiles, and in verse 2, against Egypt. You see, against Gentiles, against Egypt. Um, there's some questions you might have about that. that. That's just like a quick verse that I have. There's a few more verses on our glossary, though, to read. But Gentile represents the, the uh, excuse me, Egypt represents Gentiles as a whole. Whether that's, again, not Jewish or not heavenly. Either context, okay? Um, again, I, I would recommend the glossary for all this. This is the one that I haven't really gone over a lot. This was just added to the glossary, so many of you may not have seen it. But horse is not something, I put a little question mark here. Uh, I'm not saying that horse, this is like a definitive thing. Horse means strength. I, I, I don't have enough experience with that word to be able to just say flat out, yes, it means strength. At the very least, whatever it means, even if it doesn't mean strength, that certainly has some kind of context to strength um, within its definition because of the verses that are on our glossary. And Haggai, um, H-A-G-G-A-I, for Brother Colin back there, Haggai, uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 21 it says, I'll speak to Zerubbabel, uh, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the, so this is the Lord speaking, I will shake the heavens and the earth, just read this real quick, verse 22, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms and I will destroy, look what he says he's going to destroy, I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms, the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride, uh, ride in them and horses and their riders will come down. So he said, first he says, I'm going to destroy the strength of the nations and then names the horse, the rider, and uh, uh, and the chariots also. So that's one verse. Psalms 33, verse 17 says, I'll just read this. It says, it says a, a horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Okay? Hor a horse is great strength. Uh, Psalms 147, verse 10 says, he delights not in the strength of the horse. Okay? So just throwing a few verses at you. Uh, again, I, I, I usually like to, to see a word more thoroughly before I just say, oh, yeah, that's the definition. Um, but it certainly has the context there. Refers to strength, uh, even if it doesn't out and out mean strength. We already know, I didn't write it up here, we already know that water can symbolize the Holy Spirit. Um, not always, but it can symbolize the Holy Spirit. In all the timelines we've been through so far, water is representing the Holy Spirit. Uh, you guys already know that, so I'm not even going to go there. Standing means active, and you know what, for the sake of time, I would love to actually share this too. But standing... Uh, let me give you one verse. I'll give you one verse. I had two verses to share with you right now, but uh, Hebrews 10, 11, just, this is the easiest one that I have, so I'll just give you one. Standing means active, 
So, for instance, in Hebrews 10, 11, it says that the Old Testament priests would stand daily ministering. But Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Why do you think it was important that it said that the Old Testament priests would, would stand daily ministering? I mean, I'm sure there were some times that they sat down, right? So well, why would he say, they're always standing ministering while Jesus sat down at the right hand of God? It's important to know that because he's saying these are always active ministering, the Old Testament high priests, because they could never take away sins. They could never fix the sin problem, so they're always standing. Where Jesus did fix the sin problem and all its repercussions, because just so you know, all of sin's repercussions are physical problems. All suffering, all death, all pain, all hurt, all that is from sin. So if Jesus finished sin, he fixed all your physical problems too. Because all physical problems came from sin. But Jesus sat down in verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Uh, obviously, in, uh, in, in, in reference to the, the previous verse where he says here that every priest, the Old Testament priest, stands daily ministering because he's saying they're always active while Jesus is inactive. So that's just one verse. I do have more verses to substantiate these things. I do not just say a word means something because I see a verse. Even the word horse, if you can kind of see my, at least, methodology here, I'm not going to tell you, oh, it means, horse means strength because I have three verses that say the word strength and say the word horse in the same verse. What I actually like to do is, I like to see all those verses where the cor it's correlated, this uh, uh, strength and horse, strength and horse, strength and horse, and then see a symbolic timeline in which, which I'm going to share you, with you right now, or multiple of them, to where I can verify, oh, yeah, horse meaning strength works properly in this timeline. You know? So, uh, uh, like, like Joseph going down to the pit. Pit means hell under the earth. I get that, because then it works in the timeline, because I know that Jesus went under the earth. So if I have other verse that say that pit means hell, okay, if I apply it in this timeline, it should work then. And so... Uh, th th there's, a, there's a, a, a method to this, but anyhow, I do have more verses for this, but just get, go on our glossary. You'll be able to get all this. Stone means still. I won't even give you any verses for that. We're about to read some of them uh, right now. And morning uh, is a very similar word to the word light. Light means whatever makes manifest. Ephesians chapter 5 says that light is whatever makes manifest. Paul defined the word light symbolically there. So if anything is made visible, uh, that is light. Morning is basically just a time period of light. A time period of light. So a time in which light is shining. A time in which something is being revealed. A time in which something is being made visible. That's why I just wrote the word visible, because I didn't have enough room on the dry erase board, but it really means a time period of visibility. A time period in which something is being revealed. That's what the word morning means, okay? This is why when we see Jesus as he is in the last day, and you don't have to wait until then, but when every believer does, it's called the morning. Because Jesus, we will see him as he is. Uh, that is uh, 1 John chapter, what, 4 or 5 or something. So we will see him as he is. And if it's a time period, watch this. If, if when Jesus comes back, if that is a time period in which every believer will see him as he is, then symbolically you could call that what? Morning. A time period in which something is being made visible, in this case, Christ. Okay? All that. Okay. Anyway. So that's that. Let, let's jump into this, Exodus 12, verse 5. Again, this is not a very long timeline, so uh, don't get scared that I'm starting it right now. It's, it's, it's not very long. Um, Exodus, is a, a, Exodus 12 is a picture, timeline, of the people of Israel. Uh, well, let me say it plainly, of how we were redeemed from this earth and how we were circumcised by the Spirit through baptism. Okay, that's what this is a, a symbol of. Exodus 12, verse 5. I'm going to skip around a lot, Brother Colin, so you're going to have to be clicking around a lot through chapters and through verses. Very, very sporadic here, okay? So he says that uh, this is Passover. This is just before they left. So what was necessary before the people of Israel? And again, just stay with me on this. It's very, very cool stuff, uh, and it's not going to take as long as typical for a timeline here. So before the people left, I mean, that's why it's called Exodus, right? Because Exodus means, like, to leave, basically, to exit. So before the people uh, were, were leaving Egypt, or we could say the earth, Egypt would mean what? Not heaven, basically. Right? Not heavenly. So before we can leave the earth, right? Like exit earth. Before we, we have an article about that online, exit earth. Before you could leave earth, what had to happen? Well, just before, just before the people left Egypt, it says in verse 5, your lamb, which is a picture of Jesus, clearly. I think most of us know that. The lamb at Passover is a picture of Jesus. And it says, shall be without blemish. Obviously a picture of Jesus being without sin, because Jesus 
He, he who knew no sin had to be sacrificed for those that did, right? To take our sin. So your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Uh, and they shall take up the blood and strike it on the two side posts and the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. So you have to eat the lamb. In verse 8, it says, And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, which I have an inkling, roast with fire refers to Jesus' sufferings, um, because fire is used in that context sometimes. But anyway, uh, they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Very cool thing. Brother Colin, if you can take us to uh, Matthew 16, verse 11, while I'm talking. The reason why he says that they need to eat the flesh of the lamb with unleavened bread, I don't know what the bitter herbs represents, but the reason why he said that you have to eat the lamb with unleavened bread is because Jesus did die for everybody, for the whole world. But the only way that you can partake or eat of the lamb, the only way you can eat his flesh, the only way that you can receive what he came to give you is to do so with unleavened bread. Unleavened bread or, or leaven, leaven in the Bible is bad doctrine. Um, unleavened would mean good doctrine. Don't know all the reasons for that, but that is a fact in the Bible. Uh, in Matthew 16, 11, Jesus told them that they should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Next verse. Then it says, uh, they, then understood they how uh, he bade them to beware of the leaven of the, sorry, not to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Go real quick to 1 Corinthians ch chapter 5, verse 7. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. You see, leaven was the doctrine. He said, be careful about the leaven of the Pharisees. Be careful about the leaven of the Pharisees. And he said, that is doctrine. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, purge out therefore the old leaven, that, it, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover, confirming that he is that lamb, just because you know, cause the lamb is called the Passover. Like, it's not like we say the Passover lamb, but the lamb is actually called the Passover. So he said, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Next verse. Um, and it says, therefore let us keep the feast, referring to Passover, the, the, the reality, obviously, of it, not the old shadow. It says, not with old leaven, not with old thinking, not with old doctrine, but reform your mind, right? And not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see, um, unleavened bread here he's referring to as sincerity and truth, whereas leaven, he's saying old leaven, old doctrine, old thinking. We need, we need to clear all that stuff out. And that is how we partake of our lamb. If you want to partake of Jesus, you need to do so with unleavened bread. In other words, you need to be willing to let go of all your old junk in your head. You need to be willing to let go of that stuff. And how many times Pastor Hosea has said that too? You need to just be willing for the Lord to just wreck everything if it's untrue. I'm not saying he has to wreck everything. If it's, if it's good, great. If you've got a thing that you do all the time in, in your heart, if you've got a thought that you, you've, you've, you've practiced in your heart for many years and it's true, great. But you need to be willing to let go of the other stuff though that's not true that you've also believed for years. That's old leaven. And if you don't let the Lord teach you you guys that know the washing of the feet, this may sound familiar to you. If you don't let the Lord teach you, you can have no part with him. Right? So that means if, if you don't go the unleavened route, good doctrine, you ain't going to partake of the Lord. God is not this sovereign person that is able to just do what he wants because he wills it. No, you need to eat the unleavened bread, and that's how you eat the lamb. You partake of the lamb because you eat the unleavened bread. But without that unleavened bread... There ain't going to be any partaking of Jesus, and you will stay in Egypt. You stay a part of the world because you only come out of this world through good doctrine if you're willing to let go of the old junk leaven. Okay? Doctrine. Old doctrine. Again, if it's traditional and it's right, great. We are not against tradition here. We just choose the true Jesus over tradition because tradition is not a good enough reason to believe something. Okay? Tradition is not bad if it's good. Tradition, just if you want to define tradition as something you do all the time or think all the time, great. I think things all the time that I'm not willing to let go because I've learned from the Lord that they're true. But if you find out that they're not, you need to be willing to let go of old leaven. Verse 26 of uh, uh, Exodus 12. Let's go back to Exodus. Exodus 12, 26. And it says, um, Exodus 12, 26, and it says, And it shall come to pass when your children shall say to you, What mean you by this service? In other words, referring to Passover. Say, what, what do you mean by all of this? Verse 27, that you shall say it is a sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over our houses. Um, I'm not going to go over this right now, but you do notice that, again, the word house is referring to our flesh here. So it said the, word, the Lord passed over our houses 
of the children of Israel in Egypt, and he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. Um, so that would mean delivered our flesh. Now, I, I don't know in the context of the symbolic timeline particularly what the, the Lord smiting the Egyptians here uh, with plagues and all that. I don't know what that represents, so I'm going to kind of skip over this. But uh, we were just talking about the Lord delivering us from physical needs, right? And it does say he delivered our houses. He delivered your flesh. That is what that's referring to. I just don't, I'm unsure of the context around it. But that's referring to Jesus dying for you as the lamb and delivering your houses. Um, so anyway, let, let's go to chapter 13, verse 3. Chapter 13, verse 3. So Jesus has died, which obviously is the necessary thing to have happened, which it has already happened. So now it's just a matter of, let me get some unleavened bread to learn what my lamb already did for me. You do that for the people that do that. Um, chapter 13, verse 3. And Moses said unto the people, remember this day which you came out of Egypt, or out from Egypt. That's out from the earth, right? Not, Egypt means Gentile, or in other words, not of heaven in this context. And then he says, so you came out of Egypt this day. This, what, what day? When you eat the unleavened bread, that's when you get to come out of the earth. You're redeemed from the earth and out of the house of bondage. Out of the house of bondage. This is referring to circumcision. When you are delivered from your house of bondage, your house, your flesh before Christ was in bondage to sin and death. Paul calls it in Romans chapter 7, the law, which basically just means bondage, it means that there's an authority over you, law. The law, the governing authority of sin and death. Your house was in bondage to sin and death. And he had delivered you from your house of bondage, from living by that house, okay? So you, you'll see here how the Lord accomplished this. If you, you already know, obviously, this account. How is it, if you think ahead here, how is that these people are brought out from the earth and delivered from their house of bondage, right? Sounds like, right? You, you probably expect to see a baptism coming up here, right? We already know that, so I'm going to explain it to you anyway. But um, and it says, For by strength, of, uh, uh, by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. Man, you can look around you right now, right? You look around this, see all the physical things. The Lord brought me out of this place because the Lord is my Passover lamb who died for me. Took, Jesus took all the problems of this world on himself. And by all problems, I mean sin and death, right? That's the only problems in this world. All physical problems, every single possible physical problem Jesus took on himself at the cross to deliver me out of this place. Stuff can happen in this place, as Christians love to say, and yet not believe. We're in this world, but we're not of it. But that means not of all of it. We've been redeemed and exited from this earth because our land was sacrificed for us and we believed it, unleavened. But also out of the house of bondage. Um, this has... You'll, you'll see, um, you know, I won't even mention this right now. Because um, in, in the baptism in the, in the Noah timeline, we went over the Noah timeline. Remember when the flood was upon the earth? It says, and the ark was lifted up from off the earth. And I told you that might have some uh, correlation to our redemption from earth. So you see, even through baptism in the Noah timeline, lift up from the earth. I'm not sure if that means redemption from this earth. Because just everyone listening online, you may not understand this right now if you haven't heard that message. But... Uh, it may not mean redemption from this earth only because it said the ark, the ark, which represents our flesh, was lifted up from the earth. And I'm like, I know our flesh hasn't been redeemed from the earth yet. It's still earthly. So I have some struggles with that. But anyway, you do see that he says here in verse, verse 3, out of Egypt and then out of the house of bondage. The house of bondage, again, if you want to see the New Testament reality of what is the house of bondage, uh, don't go here, Brother Colin, but uh, Romans 7, 24, says, Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death, which is under the law, the bondage of sin and death? Who will deliver me from this body and from living by it uh, and the sin and death in it? And uh, he said, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that, us being delivered out of the house of bondage is just that. Let's, let's look at verse 20 now. So it says that the Lord redeemed us from the house of bondage. And in verse 20, it says, And they took their journey from Sukkoth. Sukkoth means booths or tabernacle. This is going to be important for next week also. Uh, Sukkoth means booth or tabernacle. And again, uh, tent, tabernacle, house, all represents our flesh. So what do you know? Just before they go through the Red Sea and are baptized, they take their journey from their booth. They take their journey from their tabernacle. They leave their tabernacle behind. Sounds like the putting off of the flesh or the body of the sins of the flesh through baptism. 
right? That's what it sounds like, and that's what's happening right here. They take their journey. Next week, God willing, we'll be reading from uh, the Joshua timeline, which is actually a long timeline. But it actually says in that timeline, to give you a little teaser for next week, they said they removed from their tents before they went through the Jordan River, the descending river. And so here, it's the, it's the parallel. Like these two things are like parallel. That's why I'm reading this one to you first. They're just parallels. Here, it doesn't say they removed from their tents, but the word Sukkoth actually means tabernacle, which I believe to be a tent, but it means a booth. It's actually, you know, you guys are aware of the Feast of Tabernacles, right? That word Sukkoth is the related word to, um, uh, Sukkoth is actually just the plural of that word, Feast of Tabernacles. That word Tabernacles is the word Sukkah, and it's, Sukkoth is just the plural of that word. So you could literally translate that. They took their journey from their tabernacles, just the same way that in the Joshua time, it says, and they journeyed from uh, or they removed from their tents to pass over the, the Jordan River. So here they're about to pass over the Red Sea, which obviously, if you haven't guessed already, is a picture of the Holy Spirit. The Red Sea, that water, Jesus said, right, out of our belly would flow forth rivers of living water. The Holy Spirit is very often referred to as water or a river, or in this case, the sea. Uh, you want to talk more about that? I can talk to you more about that later. Uh, but verse, um, so they're about to go through the Red Sea to be baptized, and it says, and they removed, they took their journey from their tabernacles from Sukkoth, uh, verse 21. And it says in verse 21, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them by the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go, uh, to go by day and night. Uh, and he took not away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. There is at one point, which I do not understand this aspect of it, that the pillar of cloud goes behind the people, briefly. Uh, I don't understand that little blip there where it goes behind the people. But the pillar of fire... And the pillar of cloud represents Jesus. If you heard our Chase Me series, I'm going to take a little tangent right here for those that know what I'm talking about. If you know the Chase Me series, right, you know that Jesus went ahead of us, right? Uh, and Jesus, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to say anything right now to confuse anybody. So let me just say that Jesus received the Holy Spirit before we did. Jesus received the Holy Spirit in his resurrection, and now we get to receive it as well. This is why the pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, goes through the Red Sea first before they do. It went before them, it says. Uh, so they're about to be baptized in the Spirit, but Jesus, the pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, went before them through the divided Red Sea to receive the Spirit before them, and then we receive the Spirit behind him. Okay? That's how it works. Uh, uh, if you want to see that, uh, Acts, don't go here, Brother Khan, but Acts chapter 2, verse 33, basically just says that Jesus, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, has poured forth this, which you now see in here. Basically, Jesus received the promise of the Holy Spirit first, and then poured it forth on all of us. So that's why the pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, goes before the people as a predecessor, receiving the Spirit, and then we receive it after him, right? But that's the Chase Me series for you. Uh, if you want a little tidbit to look into this as well, the fire and the cloud, this is why Abraham made a sacrifice and then, divide, again, those that heard the Chase Me series, you'll know where I'm coming from, divided the sacrifices in two, and then he woke up to a vision where he saw a, a uh, smoking furnace, which would be the cloud, and a burning lamp, which would be the pillar of fire, passing through the pieces, which also represent Christ going through his own sacrifice. We went over that in Chase Me series, right? Receiving the Spirit first, receive, going through, through the inheritance first, and also uh, uh, going through his own sacrifice first, which I won't get into right now. So this represents Christ going before us, receiving the Spirit, receiving the Red Sea before we did. So Jesus goes first, then we get to go through. Chapter 14, verse 12. We're getting really close to the end here. I, have, I do have a few more minutes, though, believe it or not. I feel like I've, I've got a lot covered, but... Um, uh, chapter 14, verse 12. What ends up happening is the Egyptians begin pursuing the people of Israel. I don't know 100% what all this pursuit, the pursuit here represents, uh, but I'm going to leave it at that, okay? I'm only going over the stuff that I understand with you. So verse 12, uh, the, the people of Israel see the Egyptians pursuing, right? Now, just to give you a heads up, Egypt here is going to, in a second at the very least, if not already, represent our flesh. Because Egyptian means earthly, right? Good symbol for our flesh. So what happens is, he says, is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone, that we, uh, that we may serve the Egyptians? Da, 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 they start complaining to Moses. And in verse 13, this is what it says, and Moses said unto the people, fear ye not, stand still, and the word stand still, don't read into that too much, because I believe the word stand still literally means to stand. Not, it's that word still that you might think like, oh, that has some cool symbolic correlation here, but the word just means to stand, I'm fairly certain, uh, to, like to, to, to take your stand. 
Um, and it says, and see the salvation of the Lord. And we know that baptism of the Holy Spirit is actually salvation, right? So it makes sense that he would say, we're about to cross the Red Sea, baptized by the Holy Spirit. Here comes the salvation of the Lord. You're going to see the salvation of the Lord right now, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen this day, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. That hold your peace, that is significant, because that means to keep quiet, to keep silent. We wanted the quietness and confidence and everything. That's what's about to happen to them. He said, the Lord will fight for you, and you will hold your peace. That's what's about to happen right now. You're going to be saved, and you will hold your peace. You will be quiet. Okay? Now, uh, verse 22. Verse 22. So then it says, check this out. This is the real cool part here. Verse 20, well, everything's been cool, but uh, that's why even I think when, when people say, oh, this is my favorite verse or something, it's like everything testifies about the exact same person. So can't really have a favorite verse. There's just verses you understand and verses you don't understand. <laughs> right? Verse 22, it says, and the, and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea, the Spirit, that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit right now, uh, upon the dry ground. Don't know what that means. And the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians, so when you say Egyptians, you're saying earthly, right? And the earthly pursued. Okay? That, right now, this, the Egyptians represent our flesh, which was earthly. Well, it still is earthly, but it's a good representation of our flesh because our flesh is earthly. So when he said that the Egyptians pursued, this is, I believe it's correct to say that through the baptism of the Holy Spirit that our flesh was baptized also. I'm going to leave that terminology off for right now due to unsurety. But the Egyptians going in the sea with them is representing essentially us, being baptized in the Holy Spirit with our flesh. So Israel and Egypt go down, both, into the Red Sea. This is, this is our baptism happening right now that God is explaining thousands of years before that just to let you know what you have in Christ. And it says, so the Egyptians pursued, that's our flesh, our earthly flesh. So the, the, the earthly, our flesh, pursued, went in after them in the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. This, I believe, represents the strength of men. Okay? Flesh in all of its, obviously, strength. Flesh has a certain degree of strength, just cannot produce anything profitable by that. So all the strength of flesh being baptized in the Red Sea, essentially. Then, verse 27, verse 27, Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and it says the sea returned to his strength uh, when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Let's reread this, but just like, uh, with, with, the, with the symbolic words put in place. The sea, the Holy Spirit, returned to his strength. They're baptized, and the Holy Spirit becomes our strength. I'm going to mention that in a second. Returned to his strength when the morning appeared. The morning here is probably referring to, because this is a salvation symbol. So when the morning appeared, I would assume would refer to our full assurance of faith, and would, I'm assuming that's referring to the fact that there is a point of revelation at which you do get baptized, and they were baptized when the morning appeared. So that, that just sort of makes sense to me that you get saved when you see Jesus fully, right? And that's when they were baptized, when the morning appeared. But look what it says here. Uh, and the Egyptians fled against, against the sea, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians. The Lord overthrew our earthly flesh in the midst of the sea. In other words, that our flesh was put to death uh, in the midst of the sea. Our flesh was put to death by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So you see what happens is, Israel goes down with, with the Egyptians and all of Egypt's horses and chariots and horsemen. There's all the strength of flesh is what I believe that, that's talking about. And, and I'll mention this again in just one minute. So they go in with Egypt and they come out and Egypt is dead. They go in and Egypt is alive. And they come out after the baptism and Egypt is dead. You see, Egypt represents their earthly flesh. The earthly, just so you know, after, just to give you this uh, sort of little tidbit too about the Joshua timeline that we'll go over next week, God willing, is that when they cross the Jordan River, guess what God says on the other side of the Jordan River? When they get to the other side of the Jordan River, God says, today, I ha first of all, Joshua circumcises all of them, but then he says, I have rolled the disgrace of Egypt from off of you this day. Of Egypt, referring to our flesh and saying, I've rolled Egypt off of you this day. I've killed Egypt from off of you this day after they crossed the Jordan River. So it's no surprise that even in this parallel, which is another great way to verify that a, your certain symbolic timeline is correct when you've got a whole bunch of other timelines that substantiate the same thing, and that is that when they went through the Red Sea, they went in and Egypt was alive with Egypt's horses and its horsemen. The strength of flesh was still active, 
But when they come out, Egypt is now dead. On the other side of the Red Sea, Egypt is dead. That's what happened to us. On the other side of our baptism, our flesh was dead. Our earthly flesh is dead on the other side of baptism. And on the other hand, what did it say about the sea, though? So the horsemen uh, and the chariots, which, again, have some context to strength here. We went over that before. The strength of flesh is circumcised in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then when they pop out on the other side, what happens? It says, and the sea, in verse 27, and the sea returned to his strength. I don't understand the word returned exactly, because the word return does mean to return or to turn back. But for lack of knowledge of that, I still understand what this is saying. The sea becomes the strength, and the flesh's strength is put to, put to death. You see, the horse and the horsemen go in. That the, the horses of Egypt, so the strength of our flesh, is put to rest. This is why God doesn't care about your talents or anything. Because all of us had varying different degrees of fleshly ability. All useless, but varying different degree of fleshly ability. Different strengths, different weaknesses. But what's the point of all that if God's just going to throw it all out when you come to salvation? You don't bring anything like that into the kingdom that God can use now. All, the, all of your horses and chariots, essentially, of your flesh, your strength of your flesh gets put to death. And what now changes? Your strength put to death. The water's strength rises now. The strength of the sea. The sea returned to its strength now, or his strength now. In other words, to replace your flesh's strength, or Egypt's horses that died in the sea. Right? No use relying on talents. God's idea was putting all that to death. Okay? So he overthrew them in the midst of the sea. Um, just so you know, this is also what happened in our Noah timeline as well, if you remember. It says, and the waters became very mighty on the earth. When, 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 when in the Noah timeline, when the waters, the flood waters came, what happened? All flesh died. This is verbatim. It says that. All flesh died, just like Egyptians died in the water, and the waters became very mighty. Listen to that message. Just the same way it says the sea returned to its strength. The strength of the sea, just like the floods, it says, were very mighty upon the earth. That's the strength of God there for you to work through you, putting to death your own strength. Okay? Uh, verse 30, almost done here. Verse 30, thus the Lord saved Israel that day. That's an, you see how symbolic timelines, like, you wouldn't be able to share this with someone uh, that hasn't heard this before, really. But he's calling the baptism of the Holy Spirit here salvation. The Lord saved Israel that day out of the hands of the Egyptians, and, uh, it, which, out, out of the earth. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. You see, they come out, and the earthly is dead on the other side. But the sea is the strength now. The waters are mighty now. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Um, okay, let's uh, just a little bit more here, and then we're all done. Just a few more verses here in chapter 15. Chapter 15, verse 1. Literally just a few more here. I'm going to read this to you, and they're going to be very quick. Uh, chapter 15, verse 1. It, th th they're, they're through the baptism, and then it says, Moses sings a song here. Uh, and it says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spoke, and said, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously the horse and his rider. Again, I'm assuming that means the strength of flesh. The horse and his rider has been thrown into the sea, baptized in the Spirit. Uh, and it, now it said, the Lord is my strength, in verse 2. You see that? See the contrast? The horse, strength of flesh, has been killed by the sea. And now the Lord is my strength. The, see the swap of strength? Not your strength, but the strength of the Spirit of God now through baptism. Right? That's what you've been given through baptism. Uh, the Lord is my strength now, obviously as opposed to your human strength uh, and song, and he has become my salvation. Again, this is, a, this is the salvation symbolism here. He is my God, I'll prepare for him a uh, habitation in my Okay, I'm only read all that. Verse 4. Verse 4. Uh, Pharaoh's chariots, again, probably meaning here the strength of men, and his host, has he cast into the sea, has been baptized by the Spirit. His chosen captains are also drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Again, the word stone means still here. So what happens to the Egyptians? The Egyptians is a sink to the bottom as stone. That's referring to them, us becoming still now. We've been given rest by the Red Sea. We've been given rest by the Spirit. The same way the Egyptians were made stone and killed, made stone by the baptism in the Red Sea. That's what he's referring to here. 
And in verse 8, three more verses, ready? In verse 8, and with the blast of his nostrils, the waters were gathered together, the waters were gathered together, and the flood stood upright as a heap. You see that word stand? Egyptians in the baptism were made stone, that means still, and the waters stood upright as a heap. The heap part, I don't know, but the waters stand upright. That's the strength of God standing up, now being active through you, and you being made inactive or still. The same thing is actually said about the Jordan River. It says the Jordan River stood up as a heap. When the, it's the same exact parallel. I'll read that to you next week probably. Um, so you see the waters stand, and Egypt, the earthly, gets killed and made as stone. Uh, and really, I'll just finish these two verses, but verse 13 it says, you and your mercy, in verse 13, you and your mercy have led forth your people, which you have redeemed. Right? This is our, our, the day we receive the redemption of the Lord. And you have guided them in your strength unto your holy habitation. Um, and to be honest, I, I'll actually just stop right there. Um, unto your holy habitation. And what the heck? Verse 17. You shall bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. I only read those last two verses for those that understand the Chase Me series because... You know, if you understand that, you know, okay, Jesus goes before you through the Red Sea, you go in as well, there's a salvation purification that happens, and then where do they end up? The mountain of his inheritance, you know, so they plant him, they plant him in the mountain of the Lord's inheritance, so there's a mountain on the other side, so I'm not going to explain any of that, that last part, but you kind of get where I'm coming from if you've heard the Chase Me series. So anyway, all that to say, right, God doesn't need your strength, God doesn't need your talents, God doesn't need your abilities, because anything you came to the Lord with, God was going to put you entirely to rest. That is God's plan to, to make you your Egyptian part, right? Your earthly part, your flesh as stone uh, to, to kill it, overthrow it in the Red Sea, which just means to give it rest by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And just the way, the same way the people of Israel went down into the sea with the Egyptians very much alive, the horse and the rider of the Egyptian alive, but then came out with uh, seeing the Egyptians dead on the seashore is the same way that we come out of baptism uh, with a flesh that has now been given complete rest by the Holy Spirit, by our true Red Sea, right? So anyway, that, that's all that. Uh, again, it's very, very cool stuff. If you guys have a question afterwards, you can certainly come up and ask me. Um, but again, you know, I just think it's, I, I appreciate it so much from the Lord that, you know, he, he, for thousands of years, like I said before, he's been writing this stuff down just to, for no other purpose but to let you know what you have in Christ so that you can grow in these things and these things can become effectual in you. Because like I said, this rest that we just read about through the Red Sea that we, we've received is a once for all thing, right? Your Egyptian has been circumcised, has been put to rest uh, in that sense because you have the Spirit in you, but you can certainly now take advantage of that rest that you've been given at salvation um, by getting to know it, right? And that's what we're doing here right now. We're getting to know through the account of the Exodus what Jesus provided us. This is why I told you before, there is never a time where you go to a church that you should not be hearing what Jesus provided for you. You read in Exodus? Did you hear me just read Exodus and talk about you know, whatever, God keeping his promises to the people of Israel and then goodbye and amen and we'll all go home now. We should be learning about Jesus. If you're going to read a scripture, even as a pastor or a teacher, if you're going to read a scripture, if it's something you don't understand, how it correlates to Jesus, then don't be reading that scripture. I understand some pastors go through the whole Bible or something like that. You know what, I don't understand every single thing in the Bible. So I'm going to teach you what I know um, because these things testify of Jesus. If anything you don't see in Scripture, if you don't see how it testifies of Jesus, that's a part of Scripture you just don't understand yet. I don't care if it's something in Proverbs that wasn't written for business, that wasn't written for all these different things. It wasn't written for money management. It was written so that we could see Jesus, right? That's the purpose, and that's the purpose of the book of Exodus as well. All right, uh, let's pray real quick. Thank you so much, Lord, for, uh, for your word that you wrote through the apostles and prophets, Lord, uh, the help that that is to us. And thank you so much, Jesus, for uh, accounting for all these things that you hadn't even given to the world yet, but we have now received as new covenant believers. Thank you so much, Jesus, for doing all this and for showing us and revealing these truths so that we can grow in our knowledge of what we have in Christ. And Father, I just want to encourage everybody, every single person listening to me right now, if you are growing your knowledge of Jesus, if you're seeking the Lord, if you know Jesus, uh, the power of God is effectual in you. The power of God is effectual in you. You just continue beholding Jesus. The power of God is effectual in you. You have raising from the dead power on the inside of you. You have renewing all of creation kind of power on the inside of you. Power to give life to trees and planets and stars and everything in between. You have the life of God 
in ample supply on the inside of you, and that is effectual in you because you know Jesus. And if you'll continue in your knowledge of that, you're going to see the blessings of God working in your life. So thank you so much, Father, for all this, and thank you for teaching us these things. We know when you teach us something, it's because you're leading us into the manifestation of it. Thank you so much, Jesus, for that. When you're teaching us something, it's because you're leading us into the manifestation of it. So we thank you so much, Father. Lead us in, Jesus. Lead us in. Into all of our inheritance that we have inside of us, lead us into those things. Uh, We appreciate you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message from Reformed Church. If you have, please share this with someone else and help us get this unpopular message to the world. If you'd like to support Reformed Church, you can do so at reforminus.com slash give. Also on our website, you can take advantage of our free messages, articles, and even full discipleship courses. Start reforming your mind now at reforminus.com.